So back in 2014, a bunch of guys in my college dorm kept telling me about a movie starring Miles Teller and J.K. Simmons called Whiplash. Initially, I wasn't too interested because I wasn't a big fan of bands or orchestras, but my friends assured me that the film was barely even about music. It was way more about the personal and psychological struggle that the main character underwent at the hands of his overbearing and physically abusive instructor. The music of the film was more or less just a vehicle to convey the passions and wants of the characters and how far they would be willing to go to achieve them. And so eventually, I did watch Whiplash, and it was very good. It's one of my favorite J.K. Simmons performances ever. And funny enough, it seemed like every dude I talked to thereafter had seen Whiplash. From the film students, to the psych majors, to the frat bros, they all loved it too. I still remember one of my friends saying it was one of the best movies he had ever seen. And that all seemed a little bit strange to me because I had already seen Whiplash done years before and arguably better. And it was called The Devil Wears Prada. Now, for full disclosure, I've been wanting to make a video on this film literally since I started this channel three years ago, but have been terrified because of the threat of the algorithm. The vast majority of my subscribers and watchers are men, and for most of this channel's lifetime, if I didn't get enough views every month, I would make enough money to eat or pay rent. But now that the channel is in a bit of a safer spot and I have a bit of leeway, I just wanted to tell all the gentlemen out there, if you like Whiplash, if you like Christopher Nolan films, if you like psychological thrillers, please watch The Devil Wears Prada. It is not just for women. It is not just about fashion. It is a brilliantly written piece of fiction that details the menacingly transformative nature of societal pressures, capitalism, and morality. It is a dive into a world just as deep as a fantasy while showcasing the setting through witty dialogue, character actions, and fantastic acting. Not to mention that if you ever wanted to talk to a woman about a film that didn't star a grown man in spandex, this might be the best conversation starter you can ask for. And aside from being a plain, enjoyable narrative, there's also a ton of stuff to learn from the film just from a writing perspective. And since we're doing an entire video on a fashion-heavy story, I do want to give a shout out to today's sponsor, Vincero Collective. Vincero is a premium lifestyle brand in San Diego carrying incredible eyewear, watches, and much more. If you don't know them, there's no better time to check them out now because they're having a Father's Day sale, yes that's coming up, and everything is 20% off the entire site. They have rigorous quality control, and if you're environmentally minded, you can wear their products with peace of mind knowing it's sustainably made from some of the best materials available. I've been able to get my hands on some of their watches, and honestly, they're really sleek and really comfortable. I'm not even like a huge watch guy, but they might have turned me into a believer. And if you're even a bit tentative about making the purchase, just know that they do have a 365 day return policy just in case you're not completely satisfied. So again, do something nice for dad and don't break the bait doing it. If you use the code dad20, you get that 20% off and free shipping. So check them out at vincerocollective.com forward slash savage books. And while you're at it, get Dad to sit down with you and watch The Devil Wars Prada, since you will be rushing to Hulu to watch it now. So, I guess getting back to that, the first thing that I wanted to address is how the film handles its premise. From the get-go, the story is not shy about its involvement with fashion. The entire plot of the film takes place at a company called Runway, a fashion magazine and an industry influencer. The growth and transformation of the main character, Andy, is exemplified by her fashion choices and how they change throughout the narrative. Heck, even much of the presenting conflict is pointed towards fashion shows, fashion deals, and fashion designs. But I cannot overstate this enough, the film is not about fashion. It's the exact same scenario in how Whiplash isn't really about music, or Black Swan isn't really about ballet, or Inception isn't really about dreams. Fashion and the world around it is simply the background of the narrative and the setting of the events within. The actual story of The Devil Wears Prada is about Andy's internal struggle. Specifically, how she is forced to change in order to cope with the difficult situation she has found herself in, and how far she is willing to go, and who she is willing to hurt to succeed. That is a much more interesting, universally impactful narrative center than just clothes. The Devil Wars Prada is a psychological thriller because of the main character's battle against gaslighting, Stockholm Syndrome, mental guerrilla warfare, and her own wavering conception of self-worth and identity. All that just happens to be wrapped up in a very inviting package of dresses and heels, but make no mistake, in the same way that Neiman is pushed to literally bleed and sweat for his craft because of Fletcher, transforming into an obsessed whipping boy because of his pursuit of greatness just off the horizon, Andy does the same thing because of Miranda. 
and how the individual characters are presented also contributes to the complexity of the narrative. As the protagonist and main character, Andy is of course introduced to us to be down to earth and likable. We are meant to understand Andy on a personal level. She's meant to be just like any of us. And that is because the more deeply we know Andy at the start, the more we can recognize her transformation throughout the film. She is not one of those main characters that is objectively in the right and fighting for good. The entire reason she finds herself in this horrendous, destructive job is because she put herself there. And the reason she starts to change is to better conform to the cultural and societal expectations of her workplace in order to avoid abuse and persecution. Andy has a consistent mantra throughout the film that she's only doing this job as a stepping stone for a greater career, that she will quit at the first opportunity. But during the course of her occupation, her identity becomes fundamentally changed to better reflect a job that was only supposed to be temporary. Andy is a flawed, dynamic, nuanced character because she makes the very understandable, if unhealthy, decision to conform to her abusers to relieve her stress and pain, but also does not garner much sympathy because she's the only one keeping herself in a system of abuse. She can leave whenever she wants, but that is the entire insidious nature of abuse. Her mind is being altered to believe that she must endure pain to achieve some future happiness that is not guaranteed to come. And to maximize the effect of this transformation and struggle, the entire rest of the cast is an inverse of Andy. Where she is dynamic and changing, the rest of the cast is very purposefully static and stagnant. The reason this writing convention is utilized is to use these side characters as a benchmark to always properly gauge Andy's transformation. If everyone else stays the same but Andy changes, her progression is much easier to see. Andy's friends are your average everyday adults and they stay that way, so the farther Andy moves away from them on a personal level, the more we see how far she's changed. Her boyfriend Nate does not change, but is used as a benchmark to show that Andy's sacrifices and sycophantic lifestyle to Miranda not only affect her, but spill over to others. The more Andy hurts Nate, the more we can see she changes. And of course, Miranda doesn't change throughout the film. She's just as cold and domineering at the start as she is at the end, but the entire point of that fixed position is to show the protagonist character movement. The more Miranda approves of Andy, the more we can recognize that Andy has changed. Stories do not always need every character to be dynamic and complex. Sometimes static characters offer much more use for your narrative. But that is not to say that the characters in The Devil Wears Prada are completely flat and simple. To the contrary, they all add to the nuanced uncertainty of the decisions Andy has to make. Her friends, while being relatable, kinda suck at some points. They don't take Andy's job seriously, make fun of her for changing, and don't offer much in the way of support. Andy's boyfriend, Nate, while very justified in his dissatisfaction in their faltering relationship, kind of behaves like a pouting baby at some point and does not try to communicate with Andy on expectations going forward. And even when characters do communicate with Andy, it's not always straightforward or simple. Take Nigel, for example. Think of him as Fashion Gandalf. His archetype in the film is the wise, kind mentor for the main character in the new land filled with danger and uncertainty. He is meant to dispense invaluable guidance to the protagonist and help their progress with his own expertise of the setting. And this is exactly what happens in the film. Except when you go back and think that this is the advice Nigel gives. Quit. I can get another girl to take your job in five minutes. You have no idea how many legends have walked these halls. And what's worse, you don't care. Because this place, where so many people would die to work, you only deign to work. On the surface, it does seem like an optimistic message of be happy with the amazing opportunity that has come to you and use it to the fullest. But in reality, that is evidence that Nigel is so used to the system of abuse and corruption that he does not even recognize it anymore. His sagely advice to Andy is to suck it up and be grateful that she can be a wage slave, breaking her back all over New York doing completely unreasonable tasks for the possibility of better employment down the line. And the huge selling point is that other women would jump at the chance of being abused like Andy, so Andy should be grateful for it. Again, it's only later when you realize that Nigel himself is hopelessly lost in the cycle of abuse that you understand why he gave this advice. When the time is right, she'll pay me back. <clears throat> you sure about that? No. It's all he knows. It's the environment he lives in. It's a cutthroat world where people are replaced and brought in every few months. And the way this story delivers contextual exposition about the setting also has much to be learned from. 
Even though it might not be readily apparent, the Double Wears product treats its delivery of information in much the same way that a fantasy does. Or I suppose, more specifically, in the same way that a parallel world fiction does. Fantasies often have the younger or less educated character that can be used as a funnel for exposition. This makes it so that there is a reason in universe to talk about the established history and rules of the setting. Parallel world fictions get a free pass on this because the main character is usually completely ignorant on how the world functions. The reason these adventure style stories seem so engaging and immersive is because the main character is in the exact same position as we, the viewer. We both know nothing about the world. So as the protagonist grows and becomes more confident navigating the world, so do we as viewers, and that mirrored growth fosters connectedness. The Devil Wars Prada does the exact same thing with its exposition and world building, except instead of a literal different world, our new foreign setting is the fashion industry. And because of Andy's ignorance of the setting, we learn the rules, expectations, and culture of those people within. But the guiding light of exposition should always be to provide information to the viewer that contextualizes the immediate events of the narrative. If the information you are telling the viewer doesn't help them better understand the conflict or the character motivations or growth, then it shouldn't be in the story. And the Devil Wars Prada seems to understand this well. As far as I can remember, there are no long dissertations into the history of denim just for the sake of it. There isn't a grand speech about the power of Louis Vuitton on the financial market. I didn't need to know the history of the fictional company Runway or the in-depth lore behind the previous failed assistance. So the movie didn't bother. Sure, is there a time when exposition is cool and builds up the world to make me enjoy it more? Absolutely. But that usually comes when the world itself has become a character and is already loved and known, making the exposition more like character development. In The Devil Wears Prada, that is a bit unnecessary because again, the fashion industry is not the focus of the story. Andy's journey through it is, and that journey is made smooth by the exposition being hidden behind character development and action. And you're also blithely unaware of the fact that in 2002, Oscar de la Renta did a collection of cerulean gowns, and then I think it was Yves Saint Laurent, wasn't it, who showed cerulean military jackets? I think we need a jacket here. Mm. This is no different than a fabled swordsman cutting down assailants, demonstrating his skills for the first time on screen. The fashion exposition works to show Miranda's expertise and intelligence, all those aspects of her character that we had previously been told about. And another amazing little character building detail is that Miranda is so dedicated to her craft that she is constructing an entire outfit in the middle of attacking Andy. She is a genius in her field and treats our protagonist as if she is an afterthought to her own work because she kind of is. And finally, she completely psychologically undresses Andy by accenting how her obliviousness of the fashion industry does not protect her from its influence. And it's sort of comical how you think that you've made a choice that exempts you from the fashion industry when in fact you're wearing a sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room from a pile of stuff. And all this is really subtext for Miranda saying that she controls Andy since she is the pinnacle of the fashion world. This scene is a microcosm of the entire movie too and that can lead us into talking about its driving force, Miranda Priestley. I feel like this doesn't even need to be said at all, but Meryl Streep freaking killed this role. And it's her presence in the narrative that causes so much of the tension and stress that really elevates this film into a psychological thriller. Even before she appears on screen, it is evident that she is the nucleus of this story's universe. People rush to get into place, panic fills the air, identities shift and change as high-end shoes go on and food goes in the garbage. It's a beautiful way of visually showing the standard that Miranda demands and the unsustainability of staying at her level. And of course, when she actually appears on screen, we see exactly why she's at the top of the food chain. I don't understand why it's so difficult to confirm an appointment. No, I'm so sorry, Miranda. I actually did confirm last night. Your incompetence do not interest me. Tell Simone I'm not going to prove that girl that she sent me for the Brazilian layout. I asked for clean, athletic, smiling. She sent me dirty, tired, and paunchy. And a huge reason for these over-the-top displays is because Miranda is barely on screen during the film. When she does appear, her mark has to be unmistakable. Since her main function in the narrative is to challenge and transform Andy, Miranda's interactions with her have to be decisive and impactful. Her abuse and humiliation starts early and it's put into motion through the writing process called Destruction and Renewal. I went over this in detail in my Homelander video, but we can briefly describe it here. In Destruction and Renewal plotlines, the pillars of a character's identity are destroyed in order to rebuild that character in another image. In Andy's case, her pillars were personal convictions, her friends, and her boyfriend Nate. 
Her convictions were the first to go as Miranda started to insult and abuse her. You have no style or sense of fashion. Well, um, I think that depends on what you're... No, no. That wasn't a question. Miranda specifically worked to make Andy uncomfortable with how she presented herself, which is analogous with her making Andy uncomfortable with her own identity. I said to myself, go ahead. Take a chance. Hire the smart fat girl. Comments on her weight, her competence, her worthiness as a person all contributed to making Andy change her outward appearance, which then leads to Andy changing her inner self and personality. And from there, Miranda has won. As soon as Andy started taking pride in being the good assistant, especially when compared to Emily, she then willingly allowed herself to be abused in order to stay in Miranda's good graces. Miranda then monopolized all of Andy's time, making sure that the other pillars of her identity, her friends and her boyfriend, came second to her. Miranda didn't have to interact with Andy's social life at all. She knew that Andy would sabotage herself because of her dedication to the job. And when those initial pillars of identity were destroyed, Miranda worked to rebuild Andy in her own image. She believed that Andy could be a second version of herself, a messiah to take the reins of the fashion industry, a person who was ruthless and obsessively focused. I see a great deal of myself in you. You can see beyond what people want and what they need and you can choose for yourself. And it's only when directly confronted with this reality of becoming a second Miranda that Andy finally sees how far into toxicity and denial she has fallen. And probably the best thing this story does is to not exclusively glorify Miranda as this all-powerful, rich, respected superboss. There is a fantastic scene where we see Miranda vulnerable, where we see that her life is not perfect, that all the work she has done for herself has come at a tremendous personal cost. But even in her vulnerability and sorrow, she cannot separate herself from thinking about her career because it has become her identity. Is there anything else I can do? Your job. Miranda is a self-abuser. This is a demonstration of what awaits Andy if she were to continue working with Miranda. The scene is pivotal in giving context to why Andy ultimately decides to leave at the height of her success. She escapes the cycle of abuse and is able to re-establish the former pillars of her identity. And that leads to the final point of this video. Aside from the incredible acting, the smooth dialogue and exposition, and the exploration of the human psyche, The Devil Wars Prada is just a really well done example of a feminist piece of fiction. So many times, social issues around inclusion become in-your-face pseudo-parodies of the group they are trying to demarginalize. If we want to stick with femininity, think of the eye-rolling scene in Endgame where all of the female characters were shoved on screen to have their obligatory power moment to show how they were just as useful as the men. This became such a pandering meme that the boys had satirized it in the last season and honestly did a much better job of showing women in action and autonomy. And I understand that I am a man here, so everything that I say comes from an outsider's perspective. But I would argue some of the best representation of women and femininity come from stories that treat women as people rather than sociocultural chess pieces. Many times, if a cast is largely a marginalized group, the focus of their inclusion degrades down to being exclusively about their inequality. A black cast will usually have a story on blackness and the black experience. A female cast will usually have a story of the uniquely female aspects of life. But if I see a largely white male cast, I don't immediately think there's some agenda behind it or direction. I just think they're a bunch of guys in a movie. And while it is very important to have narratives that detail and bring to light the struggles of marginalized communities, it is also important to tell stories that fight against stereotypes by normalizing the humanity of marginalized groups. The Devil Wears Prada is an excellent representation of that to me because while almost all of the main cast were women, their issues and struggles were not women-centric. These ladies were simply humans and people dealing with stresses of their minds and occupations. The film could have been completely gender bent to Satan wears sandals featuring all men and nothing about the core story would have changed. Because again, the story isn't explicitly about the female experience, but it portrays women as people just like men who deal with struggles just like men. Andy was a woman, but she wasn't goo goo gaga for dresses and heels. Heck, she started the movie with a pretty inset prejudice against women who liked fashion. Miranda is a woman, but she is authoritative and intimidating and abusive, just like any man could be. 
Nigel is a gay dude, but his sexuality is not the focus of his narrative involvement, his skill in fashion and business acumen is. Yes, is there a more distinct interaction between the fashion industry and women? Sure. But it is not an exclusively female industry, nor does femininity have a monopoly on fashion. And the only reason I make a point of this is because, generally, it's men who complain most about female characters while simultaneously writing most female characters. The vast majority of high-profile fictions are constructed by men, and have been for a while. But the problems come from tons of female characters being written as feminine stereotypes rather than just characters. That or male writers feel that they have to nearly comically empower women in order to preemptively avoid the critique of sexism, which in and of itself is a biased and shallow way to represent women in fiction. This isn't about wokeness or being a social justice warrior, it's about improving the quality of the characters we create by recognizing the tropes and stereotypes that we unwittingly assign to them. Women in fiction can be more than just the motivating factors for male characters to move into action, but women also don't need to be condescendingly coddled in fiction to be perfect and infallible. In my eyes, The Devil Wears Prada is a great showcase of how to present female characters within a conflict and a story that depicts their unique, personal struggles. It's a surprisingly nuanced critique of what it means to be a good worker and a good person and how to balance the two. But it's also a psychological roller coaster that shows a woman's journey to the precipice of abuse and self destruction, only for her to forgo her toxic job for peace of mind and happiness. Again, on the surface, it might not be what initially appears to be interesting to men, or what men have been told to be interested in, but The Devil Wears Prada has a story and message that is not gender specific, but human centered. And that's why, gentlemen, you should watch it. Anyway, Thanks for watching all the way until the end of this. If you like what you heard, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to be a real homie, support the channel on Patreon or check out my website for editing services. As always, it was a pleasure, and I will talk to you all again soon.